Welcome everyone from the snow-covered campus of the University of Notre Dame. Um, a happy new year, our first uh, a live chat uh, in 2022. Thank you so much for joining us. It, it Temperatures are in the low 30s today, which makes for things to be unseasonably warm. Uh, we've been in single digits and even with wind chill uh, below zero here for the last week. So we're feeling pretty good about ourselves being in the low 30s. Students are scurrying about campus uh, to try to get us quickly uh, from, uh, from uh, their dorms to the dining halls to the classroom buildings. And the wiser among them are finding ways still, uh, like many of you used to do, to cut through buildings uh, to be indoors uh, for as long as possible. Uh, we're, uh, we began classes, the new semester, uh, this past Monday, so just two days ago. And currently, we are in a booster vaccination clinic is being hosted in the Joy Center uh, to, from January 11th through the 14th. Uh, the goal is to get as close to 100% of our student body, uh, the roughly 12,000, uh, 300 or so of the undergraduate, graduate, and professional students um, fully vaccinated and boosted. And then next week, that same clinic will exist for all faculty and staff who are uh, not yet boosted. And so the, the goal is when we get everybody is to wear masks on campus in buildings, um, except uh, when we get to the point where we have over 90% of our students, faculty, and staff boosted, and they have uploaded uh, the fact that they have their booster um, in the system, uh, then uh, we'll relax uh, some of the uh, mask requirements for uh, indoor spaces for those who you know, reside and work within the community. Still vi visitors will have to uh, be masked when you come back to campus. Um, so that's a little bit of an update on where we are with uh, uh, this this COVID pandemic that they're calling it more of an endemic now. And, um, it, you know, fortunately, uh, um, while it's the, the contagion has certainly spread, um, the severity uh, of the cases uh, seems to have lessened for those that certainly are vaccinated and boosted. Uh, so that's our focus right now. But I'm really pleased today to introduce to you a, a good friend, somebody I respect deeply and feel privileged uh, to work closely with Father Dan Grudy. He is an Associate Professor of Theology and Global Affairs, and he is the Vice President and Associate Provost for Undergraduate Affairs. Dan is also a Fellow and a Trustee of the University. Within the Board of Trustees, there are 12 Fellows, six Holy Cross Priests, six Laypersons, and among their responsibilities, they are there to watch over, care for the Catholic character, to safeguard the Catholic character of the university. In addition to all of these responsibilities, uh, Father Dan is an advisor for discernment and discovery uh, for our students, um, uh, many people my age and, and older, in Notre Dame's Inspired Leadership in Initiative, an absolutely wonderful program where you can come back for a year on campus and take classes and work on your own spiritual discernment in terms of next steps. Maybe we'll get Father Dan to say a few more words about that. Father Dan is internationally recognized expert on migration and refugee issues. Uh, he has written uh, papers and books that have been translated uh, in seven different languages and on issues of theology, globalization, migration and refugees, uh, Father Dan has addressed and worked with the United States Congress, the U.S. Uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops, the World Council of Churches, the Vatican, the United Nations, and beyond. So it's a great uh, pleasure. Father Dan uh, graduated uh, with a Program of Liberal Studies uh, degree in 1986 as an undergrad from Notre Dame, went on to uh, Berkeley where he got his PhD in theology and uh, returned to his alma mater in 2000 and has been teaching and leading and living in the dorms with our students ever since. So 
Welcome, Father Dan. It's great to, to have you uh, with us today, and I, I really look forward to uh, to hearing more about your story. So maybe we can start out at the most foundational letter level. Tell us a little bit about growing up. Where did you grow up? Who were your primary influences? And uh, what about your background should we know that's helped to shape you into the person that you are today? Yeah, thanks, Lou. Great to be with you. You know, Lou, I grew up in Philadelphia. I started there. And as you know, Philadelphia is a, is a name that means fraternal love. So I think a lot about my journey has been learning how to love. And mm -hmm. that began in the family. So I had wonderful parents that uh, really uh, just helped me grow up as a person. And I have four other brothers and sisters. I'm the youngest of five. And my dad worked for the phone company. And so he was in the communication business. And in different ways, I think my life has also evolved in the communication business. Uh, for a while, I was working with AT&T and then the Bell companies as they broke up. Um, but um, I think there are many different ways in which as a family, like every other family, we had our own struggles and fights and we had our own issues. But really, uh, as John Paul II says, the family is really the first school of love. Yeah. And so I'd like to think about my background as really uh, learning how to love. And, and I think over time, uh, that's taken shape in different spaces. Uh, there's a lot of different kind of elements to my life, but I think one real foundational moment for me was in addition to moving around different places and learning how to be a new kid and starting over and adapting and changing uh, was when I was an exchange student in Uruguay in Argentina. It was in 1981 and it was a time of the military dictatorship. And you know this, Luke, because you lived uh, under Pinochet in Chile. Yeah. And I think both the time of living in a different culture, learning a different language, going through the displacement of being away from home, um, and also living in the context of a lot of injustice and human rights violations, these things shaped me a lot, uh, both yeah. in terms of understanding what's happening in the world in a bigger way, uh, wanting to respond to that. But in its own way, too, it was the beginning of a, a very conscious spiritual journey that took place when I was in Uruguay. That's fantastic. I, you know, I didn't know, uh, Father Dan, that you are a Philly native. I should have known that. I, and, you know, I, 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 I'm sure I'd known it, but I'd forgotten it. So Philly people, in addition to fraternal love, they've got a little edge to them. They're kind of, you know, competitive and, and tough. They've got some grit to them. Um, I, I, I can see that you, you have bought into the fraternal love, but you, tell us a little bit about the competitive edge. <laughs> well, uh, you know, we moved into New Jersey and also into Connecticut, so it's hard to actually uh, say that that's actually where I was 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 rooted as I grew up. Pittsburgh as well was where my mother was from. And so I became more of a Steelers fan than anything else. Oh, interesting. But, but um, one of the things we did growing up too is we loved to ski as a family. So I think if my competitive edge came out anywhere, uh, it was in learning how to ski. And there's nothing more exhilarating than throwing oneself down a mountain and uh, really letting go and enjoying both the beauty of nature and the exhilaration of sport. Yeah, well, you know, you're, you're always... Uh so understated when it comes to yourself, but I know that you're a terrific athlete and and you're still, um, I've talked with some some good friends who have skied with you recently and they marvel at your skills down the slopes and what a terrific athlete you are. And, and you push yourself. So this Philly, New Jersey kind of uh, background, I love. Um, you, what inspired you? I know that you took a bike trip when you went from, I think, was it uh, Portland, Maine to Portland, Oregon? You you biked there. Maybe it was the reverse, but you biked across the entire country. I mean, that takes some grit and some edge. Tell us a little bit about that trip and uh, and why you did it. You know, when I graduated from Notre Dame, I went into the seminary and, and uh, I had a sense of calling on my heart, but I really didn't know where this road was going to lead. But underneath that was the deep thirst for adventure. And I, I realized that I really hadn't seen a lot of the country and I love nature. But with that spirit of adventure, a friend of mine and I, who I was in the seminary with at Langlois, uh, we basically dipped our tires into the uh, ocean in Portland, Maine, and uh, we biked all the way to the other side to Portland, Oregon. And I've often considered that trip um, a microcosm of really the journey of life. Uh, mm -hmm. Our life really begins at birth in the waters of birth and in a baptism. And they end at death when the priest sprinkles a casket and remembers where we started. 
And in between that, there's all kinds of terrain. And we yeah. did. We had people who welcomed us, who drove us off the road. We had people who showed us tremendous hospitality and people who threw stuff at us. Uh, but we saw mountains and deserts. We uh, traversed kind of droughts as well as snowstorms. Um, and I've often gone back to different experiences we've had and uh, have seen that as a way of understanding the different terrain we encounter on the journey of life. So that spirit of adventure, I think, has always been part of me, uh, whether it be skiing or whether it be biking. But I get tired when I think about that trip right now, but it was a tremendous <laughs> adventure. How long did that trip take? Uh, and then also, did, did you ever read, uh, I think it was a Robert Persig, was the, the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It would almost seem to me that that you would have had some Chautauquas along the way where you 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 had these big uh, philosophical and spiritual uh, moments. Uh, but I don't know, it just resonates with uh, that book. Yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because you and I are both PLS majors and I read that book as an undergrad. That probably did plant a seed in some way of, of trying to think about ideas. And, and you know, when I was here as an undergrad, I, I really thought about my, my life um, in terms of where it would go in terms of a career. But as I got to Notre Dame, I really wanted to think more largely in terms of its vocation. So um, it was a 75 day trip that we that we went on and 50 days of that was biking. Um, there are people who've done that, you know, much more quickly. I, I can't. That's a kind of a moderate pace. Yeah. Uh, and when you do a trip of that magnitude, I remember the one of the things that was kind of striking is that we dipped our tires in the Atlantic Ocean. We dragged them across the sand. We were 100 feet into the trip and we had our first breakdown and uh, sand got in the gears and we couldn't move any further. And so I asked my friend, I said, you know, do you know how to fix these bikes? And he says, no, I don't know how. And we looked around. we had a combined one and a half days worth of biking experience between us. And um, but we realized that each step that something broke down, we learned something new about the bikes. And I think that was a great metaphor for life. So yeah. um, there were different kind of moments in which they taught us life experiences. But we also learned how it was also a psychological challenge, not just a physical one, because I was 15 miles into the trip and I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm exhausted already. Uh, and then I realized I couldn't take the whole trip in front of me and look at it at once. I just had to take it a day at a time, often a moment at a time. So there's a lot of life lessons on the road. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And, you know, I, I love the fact that um, I want to ask you first about how you came to Notre Dame and why as an undergraduate student. And then I want to ask you a little bit more about your calling to the priesthood. But this idea of the priesthood being a call to adventure like this trip is something that where you're less encumbered to an immediate family, where you have responsibilities and demands on a daily basis. It allows you to have to lead multiple experiences within your life and a journey with so many other people. It's in some ways, I think the, 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 the true act of celibacy is, uh, is, is to not be intimate with just a few, but to spread that intimacy with so many, especially those that need you over different, different settings and different times. Tell us a little bit about, you know, first, what brought you to Notre Dame? And then I'd like to hear about your own discernment process uh, to become a Holy Cross priest. Sure. You know, I went to public schools my whole life up until I came to Notre Dame. And while I was in Uruguay, I felt the dawning of something deeper that was beckoning me. And I knew that I wanted to explore more what that was. And I had a, an uncle who would come here first and he, he really introduced me to Notre Dame and at that, that planted a seed. And I realized that Notre Dame was a place where I could explore a spiritual dimension in my life and try to ask, you know, who is this God that I've learned about growing up, but I've never really known personally in quite the same way as I encountered him when I was in Uruguay and Argentina. So really at that time, it was a thirst to kind of know God more deeply. I had no idea that I would become a priest mm -hmm. on the other side of this. Uh, this was not my idea to become a priest. Uh, this was really not something that I came up with. In fact, I ran from it at the beginning. I was kind of happily on a track towards a career in business. Uh, it was a girl that I was in love with. I actually thought that that was actually the path that I was going to take. Um, God kind of messed up with that plan and threw me into a, a place of confusion for not a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And when I was on the road biking uh, to Portland, Oregon, it was sorting through that. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, I'm happier as a priest now than I've ever been, Lou, I have to say. Mm. Um, the graces have never been greater. The crosses have never been heavier. But mm. I'm more grateful to be a Holy Cross priest, to be part of a great group of 
of, of men and, um, and also Holy Cross sisters as well, who, who really um, have taught me a lot about being a human being, have, have opened up doors and spaces and provided mentorship and opportunities, uh, but I'm also part of a common mission that mm -hmm. to me has been extraordinary, but it's nothing I would have ever imagined. So my life is not anything I thought it would be, but it's more than anything I asked for or imagined. Yeah, it's a radical calling, uh, I think, uh, you know, looking, you know, from the outside in. I mean, it, it, to become a Holy Cross priest, you take three principal vows, as I understand it, right? A, a vow of chastity, a vow of poverty, and a vow of obedience. Um, these are increasingly countercultural vows that you take. I mean, we, we, we don't like to be obedient, right? We like to um, to, to, to be independent and rigorously independent, especially in this country. And, and uh, you know, a vow of poverty, people like to possess and grow and have security and safety. And then a vow of chastity, chastity we all gravitate to intimacy in, in many ways and to, um, to, to not want to, 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 to lead the loneliness and, and, and to feel the brokenness that is our common bond. Tell us a little bit about those those three vows and how they've played out in, in your life over time. Yeah, it's been a long learning process, uh, Lou. I'd have to say underneath all those vows, though, is something even more fundamental. And it took me a while to really get a sense of this, which is the call to surrender mm -hmm. and to, to really a deep surrender to God with everything that you are, even what you're not. <laughs> so that total surrender to God is not saying that we make a perfect surrender. Only Christ himself made a perfect surrender. Uh, I think we even a part of my journey to the priesthood was surrendering even what I had difficulty surrendering. And all those things that you mentioned were very difficult to surrender. Yeah, I would not say that the call to be a priest, though, is not a call uh, to intimacy. I, I, I think it's actually to be to really understand the, the deepest parts of what it means to be human. Yeah. And that in that sense, it's very intimate. And, and I think what I find that. Um, I'm more of a doctor of the soul. I sometimes think um, that I'm more of a cardiologist at heart, literally, and um, trying to understand intimately the heart of God, but also understand the hearts of the students that I work with, uh, other people that I've worked with in ministry and my research as well. Um, so I think, to my surprise, it's actually um, a deeply intimate journey, and but because it, ultimately it's about relationships. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think that that it does call into questions what we idolize in terms of our own personal freedoms, mm -hmm. our own kind of uh, attachments to wealth, uh, and also um, and and pleasure and other things that we can make more important even than God Himself. So mm -hmm. I think it's it's about ordering them in such a way that we realize that what matters most is God, God's kingdom, and and really our surrendering to our mission within that. So. To me, um, poverty, celibacy, and obedience don't make sense as negatives that you choose, especially mm -hmm. in contrast to really what are some of the most fundamental values of life, which is relationships and connections mm -hmm. and the created order of, of things. That, that ultimately, it's about trying to see what really matters is God, and mm -hmm. that journey is ultimately about God. Oh, fascinating. Great, great, uh, great reflections on that. Um, I've always been... Um, um, fascinated, intrigued by your area of scholarship, um, basically focusing on issues of migration and refugees. Um, can you tell us where, how did that evolve? Where, where did that come from? And, and, and tell us a little bit about what fascinates you, continues to fascinate you after all these years about pursuing these uh, areas of scholarship. I'd like to think this issue found me more than I found it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, more generally, as I mentioned, we moved around a lot. So I knew the experience of migrating, you know, if you will, in a corporate way from different school systems and different places and neighborhoods. But there's nothing really in my background that, that connected me to economic migrants per se. But after I went to Uruguay and I experienced the desaparecidos uh, and the family mm -hmm. that I live with in Argentina, um, the, the human rights violations, it, it really woke me up to say there's a bigger world that I need to attend to. Mm -hmm. Notre Dame helped me discover that, you know, the calling that God is, is placing on us is to really respond to those challenges. And so as I started working in Latin America, I went back to Chile where you were, Lou, some years later. Um, and then that naturally led me to the Hispanic ministry. Mm -hmm. I was interested in the spirituality of the Latinos that I was working with in parishes. 
and in communities that I work with. But the more I got into the spirituality of the Latinos, the more I realized that they were immigrants. And so that in time led me to sort of a twofold focus, which was to utter, to study the outer journey of peoples, but also to study the inner journey into the human heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, at first, it didn't make any sense. The people that I work with in migrant camps in California and elsewhere, they didn't really care that I know. They just want to know that I cared. Mm -hmm. The people that I worked with when I later went on to graduate school didn't care that I cared. They just cared that I know. <laughs> uh, and so it was kind of in, being in between these worlds. Um, and um, But I finally realized that being on the border of those two worlds was where my scholarship emerged. And I embraced that as a challenge mm -hmm. rather than a limitation. I thought this was an opportunity. And so in time, I really began to do reflections on the spirituality of migrants, but also on the theology of migration. So you, you, I've heard you speak before about migration and, and you do a beautiful job tying it back to the, the Holy Family. And, and just historically over time, how migration and refugee status has been with us. Um, can, you, can you give us, and I know you have a new book coming out on migration. So can you can you give us a glimpse of that history and, and its relevance through today and a little bit about what you try to treat in this new book that would be coming out in the fall? Yeah, Lou, let me uh, even put that more in the context too of being an educator in the faith. Again, when I came to Notre Dame, I was inspired by great teachers, great priests, great lay people who, who really helped me explore kind of the ideas of the mind and the heart and help me understand those questions in light of a larger journey of my life. Uh, it really was to my surprise that I that when I met Holy Cross, that I realized that being an educator in the faith would be so significant and so central and resonate so deeply with my life. So I think um, as I you know joined the community and really entered into that mission, uh, my mentors really said, you need to go on and do further studies. And they just mm -hmm. said, only go to the best program and study what you're really passionate about. So I wanted to study theology and spirituality and eventually this kind of led me into this, this field of study. So I think learning, uh, when I came to Notre Dame, I you know started with this, but like all things, you grow in your knowledge of an area. And so I think what began is a basic intuition about a connection between migration and the scriptures or Christ and migration. I, be I began to realize over time that Christ himself was a migrant, that Christ himself really left his homeland and migrated into the sinful and broken territory of our, of our world. But he did so, and he laid down his life on a cross so that we can migrate back to our homeland. Mm -hmm. so Thomas Aquinas really says that this movement from God and this return to God, or if you will, the migration, if you will, of God to us and our return migration to God is fundamental to our identity mm -hmm. and who we are as human beings and who we are as Christians. So this became sort of the larger framework uh, in which I then began to look at migration and refugee studies around the world, because I dialogue with political science and economists and sociologists, but I'm a theologian. Mm -hmm. so I don't pretend to be a person who really is working operatively on policy or other issues. It hopefully touches upon that, but at, at the core, I, the questions I have are theological questions. Mm -hmm. So I'm really looking forward to reading this new book that's coming out in the, in the fall. Um, can you, t what specifically do you try to address in this, in this book? I think at, there's a lot of controversy around migration. It's one of the most complex, difficult, challenging, vexing issues that we face. But I think we're caught in a binary impasse between legal, illegal, citizen, foreigner, native, alien. These, these folks, this doesn't work. Um, but what we really suffer from is a lack of imagination about who we are and who other people are. And why the dominant political narrative um, really moves us from our unity as a human community to otherness the Eucharist actually moves us from otherness to oneness. That's really what ultimately salvation is about, is trying to get Humpty Dumpty back together again. I mean, if we take our fragmentation, our brokenness as a human community, how do we come back to unity again? One of the things that really inspired me was Pope Francis, when he was elected Pope shortly after he was elected, he heard a story about a group of refugees that had left the African coast um, and they were crossing uh, the Mediterranean and they pack about 700 people into these boats and the boat capsized and only eight people survived. And they survived by clinging to a fishing net in the middle of the ocean. But when the fishermen saw them, instead of saving them, they actually severed their nets and cast them to die into the ocean depths. And Pope Francis was so moved by this indifference to the plight of these migrants that he actually went down to this island of Lampedusa and he used a chalice at a mass he celebrated there that was made from the driftwood of a refugee boat. Hmm. 
So one theological question that I really was working with was, what does it mean you use a chalice made from the driftwood of a refugee boat? Mm -hmm. uh, and so the book explores what that means in the context of Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And the bishops in our country in the same way each year have a mass at the border between Mexico and the United States, right at the fence, right at the wall. And they have half the community in Mexico and half the community in the United States, but they join the altar together at the wall. And so what does it mean to celebrate the Eucharist from the context of such a divided political reality? Mm -hmm. So it's really about a, a theology of communion, um, mm -hmm. Lou, and to try to see how do we think about communion in the midst of some of these divisive political issues like migration. Oh, sounds like it's going to be a fascinating read. Um, I'm, I find it compelling how you try to juxtapose the external process of migration with that inner journey to the soul. And I know that you teach a, a very popular course called The Heart's Desire social change. And you've converted that into a podcast uh, as well and interviewed a, a, a number of spiritual leaders from around the country and beyond. Tell us a little bit more about that uh, about that course and about the podcast. That, that course brings together probably a lot of themes that I wish that I would have had when I was an undergrad. I think when I was a senior trying to discern my next steps, I wish I had some guidance in terms of trying to think through issues of discernment, decision making, or trying to find uh, perspectives on the larger frame of my life uh, and other things. And this course uh, evolved organically and it actually came up from students that I was teaching and they became interested in some of the topics that I was bringing up in conjunction with another professor from the business school. And so a student really said, would you be interested in, in thinking about other ways of, of working through this material? So we piloted a class and actually it was just a number of students who just voluntarily said, we'd like to come together to have some discussions around questions we're dealing with. And eventually what we did is we tried to ask, what are the questions that students are asking? Uh, what are the themes related to those questions? Uh, what are the pedagogies that can help people get into those themes? And then what are the courses and programs that can help us deliver some of those teaching sort of exercises and insights? And it's from that that the course, uh, Hearts of Desire and Social Change emerged. And we found that there was cross-generational interest in this. And it wasn't just students who were undergrads who were interested in looking at meaning and purpose, but also students who were coming back to our Inspired Leadership Initiative and other programs. So I think at its core, it is about an inner migration and trying to help people uh, look at lives of meaning and purpose and how they can live more intently in their life. Mm -hmm. So tell us just about three weeks ago, um, you were invited to the Vatican and you had a chance to, uh, to sit down and meet have a private audience with Pope Francis. What brought you to the Vatican? And uh, tell us a little bit about that encounter. Uh, you know, I don't orchestrate any of these things. The invitations just come. And I, uh, you know, uh, was able to sort of follow this one where they asked me if the United Nations had asked if I would come to give a talk in Rome along with the Vatican uh, on COVID and Pope Francis's reflections on fear in the time of COVID. He has a beautiful little book that he put out recently, which said, why are you afraid? And it's a series of pictures and icons and and just sayings during COVID of, of really how he helped us navigate spiritually through this amazing crisis that we've gone through as a human community with COVID. Um, but, um, you know, often I when I get invited to these spaces, I didn't feel like I was a particular expert in this area, but I thought I could bring together even some insights from this course and, and really talk about some elements of, of how we deal with fear. Mm -hmm. uh, every one of us deals with fear in different ways, some constructively and destructively, some creatively and imaginatively. Mm -hmm. So I shared some of the things that we do at Notre Dame, but it, it was in the context as well of, of a larger uh, a conference that we were having on climate change. Um, and uh, the United Nations has asked me to work with them on some of these issues of climate change, which I've been excited about. They've asked mm -hmm. me to, to work with them on the Pope's um, decision to make a new university, the Amazon. We were starting to get into the Amazon before COVID happened, but we're trying to figure out, can we bring some leverage to um, what are the lungs of the planet and mm -hmm. think together and creatively of how um, we can really deal with these vexing, challenging, crucial human environmental issues. But also in the context of just finishing this book and dealing with migrant issues. And uh, it was a great opportunity to uh, to share just some insights um, about um, migrant refugee issues as a theologian and as a priest. Fantastic. And these are these both climate change and, and migration refugee status have been issues very dear to the heart of Pope Francis. 
So it's uh, it's wonderful that you were able to connect with him um, on that. And I'm not surprised that they would want to have you at, at the Vatican, Vatican sharing reflections on that front. Tell us a little bit about, you're one of the co-founders um, and one of the key leaders of the Inspired Leadership Initiative. Would you share with our audience what that is about and what you've seen in its initial, what is it, maybe three years or so of existence and why might some of our viewers want to uh, consider uh, be becoming a, a, a member, a, a student in the Inspired Leadership Initiative? Yeah, well, I have to say there's a great team of people working on the Inspired Leadership Initiative and uh, the core team that started this first, uh, Tom, um, Tom Schreier and Chris Stevens are really the, the co-founders of this. Um, and as they were talking to other faculty around campus, they also talked with Steve Reifenberg and myself and uh, they were just trying to get some ideas out there. And, you know, at one point they kind of were both intrigued by what Steve and I were doing. And they, and they said, um, you know, wow, this is great. We, we think this is terrific. You, you guys can help us with this, that, and the other thing. And Steve and I both had the same impression. They said, you know, we, we already have multiple jobs. We're actually not looking for another job. Um, and, um, but as through the series of conversations, uh, we actually just so love working together that we began just riffing on things. And, I always compare our time together feeling like it was the Beatles. Um, you know, we were all playing very different instruments. Tom was a CEO, uh, Chris uh, also a very established kind of corporate leader. Uh, Steve was working in global affairs. I was working in spirituality and migration issues, but we all brought our instruments to the table and we brought what we could. We didn't try to be the other. We just we tried to be who we are. And it was from that we just started creating wonderful work. And it was from that that Lauren Fox joined us uh, and others in this team. And um, we really um, tried to create a community where we realized that Harvard and Stanford are, have advanced leadership programs where people come back after an established career and they try to think about what's next. We said what's different about Notre Dame is that we actually want to go into the spiritual journey and we want to actually get a space where people can ask spiritual questions to look at the meaning and purpose of their life. Uh, so it's a work in progress, but the real work, and I'd have to say my work at Notre Dame, my work as a priest is the work of friendship. And it's really when you gather a community of friends and you're interested in common themes, you can do great things together. Yeah. Well, I think it's a, it's a wonderful program. For anybody listening, uh, you know, uh, do check out the website, uh, Inspired Leadership Initiative. Uh, to learn more, you can come back and, you know, live for a year on campus, take classes, experience um, an incredible cohort of people, wonderful faculty members, mentor some students and, uh, and, and, and spiritually discern next steps in your life and what you want to do with that kind of ultimate chapter in your lives. Um, you have a very important role now, Father Dan. You are uh, the vice president and associate provost for undergraduate affairs, which gives you kind of oversight of the academic experience and under, for our, all of our under 8,500 undergraduate students. Tell us a little bit about the scope and, and uh, insight that you bring into that role. You know, Lou, uh, since we've had these conversations before, you know, we know that Notre Dame changed us. It changed me. I know that. Um, yeah. I think that going through a program like PLS, learning to ask questions, trying to really, it was much more than I ever asked for or imagined. And, and I think most people, uh, hopefully, who are been through Notre Dame would say something similar. And what did it do? I mean, for me, it, it not only uh, formed the heart and informed the mind, but it kind of gave me a vision of really transforming the world. And I think that's really uh, part of what I bring to this space is really forming the whole person. And this is part of a larger Holy Cross vision that uh, realizes that education is about not just pouring information into people. It's not just about getting a credential and or an academic degree, but it's ultimately kind of getting a vision of life and seeing that what Notre Dame gives us as an education is something priceless. There was an article done not long ago in the New York Times that really asked the question of why spend all this money um, mm -hmm. on a Notre Dame education? I think the answer is because what you get is priceless and you mm -hmm. can't put a price on really what is something that has eternal rewards. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's hopefully what we really offer people. So what are some of the elements that if you dissect that a little bit more, we want to form people of character. Um, so that they become not only smart people, but good people. That they become curious and interested to learn, not just to get through a degree, but also and not to get a job, but also that they have a, a vision about life. That they become creative 
and that they become people who think out of the box and really learn in new ways. And so hopefully we're developing pedagogies that can help stimulate that, that they become competent leaders, that part of our job is to really have the best teachers and the best faculty so we have really strong presence in the classroom and that they really become qualified leaders. And, it, and it's always impressive when you see people in so many walks of life that graduate from this place, but not just technically competent, but they become good human beings. Mm -hmm. And in that, they have a sense of conscience that they, they, I mean, it would be my hope that, and I've seen this, I have friends who are out there who, who really, if you have 12 people working for a corporation and you say there's something different about that person, what's that difference? Mm -hmm. To me, that's what I hope would be the Notre Dame difference, that they have a sense of compassion and care, and they have a sense of just really being um, people who, who really care. So mm -hmm. I think these are the broad things, but all of that is to say, how do you also have impact? I think the questions that I'm asking now are, how do you have impact? How do you have impact on our students? How do you impact on our church? How do you have impact on the world? And what are the levers to do that? So for me, it's in our core curriculum, it's in our Moreau seminar, um, it's, it's really in our academic advising, it's in our mm -hmm. tutoring programs, um, it's in actually like looking at our valedictorian selection process, uh, it's also looking at our student athletes and how they are also supported and how they work through advising processes as well. So it's a wonderful mix of, of, of responsibilities, but it's also about forming a team. I work with great people, mm -hmm. I work with great people in administration. And when you have great people to work with, we do great things together. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a, a huge responsibility. Um, in the provost office that you've assumed recently, and, and I don't think it could be in more capable hands. Let's try to finish with our last couple of questions on a, on a more personal note. I, I know that you are a space enthusiast. So where does that come from? This Maybe it goes back to the very first question you talked about uh, being uh, adventuresome. And, and, you know, tell us about space and where did this begin and and, uh, and what are you most excited uh, about right now in terms of space adventure? <laughs> I, I really have no idea, Lou, uh, how I got so interested in space, but I think something of the technological, scientific, human disciplined achievement of going to space is just unbelievable. And when you think about it, that today's iPhone has 100,000 times more the computing power of what the Apollo mission had when they launched off in 1969. So I've always uh, figured that um, that journey to outer space, that frontier, that adventure, which I mentioned earlier, I think has always been deeply embedded into me. Um, but the other part of that, Lou, is the journey into inner space. I think we've done a lot of work in trying to get to outer space, but it's that inner space that I've talked about before that yeah. seemed to go hand in hand. What's fascinating now is this new uh, James Webb telescope that uh, they put out into space. It's now kind of launched and unfolded behind the moon. Um, that's going to look at the far reaches of the of the, uh, the galaxies and the solar system to try to figure out if we can get knowledge and insight into how this all began. So these frontiers of knowledge are fascinating, and mm -hmm. and I think we really are just tapping into that. You know, we have this amazing uh, planetarium here at the Jordan Auditorium, and you know they do this kind of show where you start at the seats in Notre Dame, and then you kind of you scale out different dimensions into the outer reaches of the galaxy. Boy, you really can't stay in that space for too long till you realize how insignificant we are and how vast and massive the universe is. And when you think about the, the God that's behind all that, all those kind of lights really literally light up. Yeah, I'm particularly fascinated. I was talking to a recent um, alum who went on and uh, did a, a, a PhD in engineering at Stanford afterwards and now is working on the, um, the expedition to Mars. And uh, which I, I think they're trying to kind of establish uh, an, a base camp on the moon and then launching uh, the, uh, um, the spaceship from the moon to, to go to Mars. Is that something that, that, that you've been following or are intrigued by as well? I'm intrigued by all that stuff, Lou. And, yeah. and again, this is a more earthly interview than the one that you did on the space station. So, but I, I was glued <laughs> into every word when you, uh, when you did the, uh, interview with the space station. I think it was an absolutely fascinating, fascinating thing you did there. Uh, we've been much better for you to be conducting that interview, to have that in your hands. But one final question, um, again, kind of, which is really great. This is like talking uh, to a PLS graduate, you know, your, your 
far-ranging uh, curiosity and intellect is, uh, is, is uh, joyful to be around. But you've also been undertaking, my understanding is, a woodworking project. Tell us a little bit more about that and why is that significant to you? You know, this is where my own research uh, in Lampedusa and with migrants and refugees and the story I told you before about Pope Francis's chalice, which he used, yeah. um, um, made from the driftwood of a refugee boat. I was working on an article for about a year on, you know, what's the meaning of this wooden chalice from a refugee boat that's used at mass? What does it mean theologically? And when I came through the other side of this, I, it, it reconnected me with a love of woodworking, which I had when I was in high school. Mm. And, and I realized that as this chalice told a story through its wood, I realized that the wood that is here on campus also tells a story. So uh, I, I don't, again, it just kind of woke up one day and I said, I gotta be in wood. So during COVID, I created a wood shop and then I worked with some of the, the maintenance folks here who have been very kind and generous to me on campus. And we started, uh, they started delivering me some of the trees that they cut down on campus. And um, it occurred to me one day that there's a story to be told through this wood. But in one story that I've been trying to tell is something related to why people are so moved when they come on the campus. Mm -hmm. So I, I just observing Inspired Leadership Initiative and graduates and alumni when they come to campus, I said, why are people so impacted when they come to campus? Mm -hmm. And one theory that I have is that the buildings themselves reveal a spiritual architecture. And by that, um, what I'm trying to do is create this river table. It's made of epoxy river from a tree that fell down in front of Corby Hall. Mm -hmm. But underneath it, I want to have doors and drawers that have etched in them these buildings. But here's the spiritual architecture that I would uh, that I'm working with is that Mary's yes, symbolized by the dome, mm -hmm. is what brings into being the word of life, which is the library, uh, which calls into being a community, Corby Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, who's called to be light in the midst of darkness, which is the grotto, mm -hmm. who are sent to be a messenger of hope to the edges of society, which is the log chapel, mm -hmm. um, as educators of the faith, which would be uh, old college, all of which is animated by love, uh, which is the basilica. So underneath these buildings are deep spiritual themes that um, are part of the heart and soul of who we are as a faith community and who we're called to be in the world. I think that's the magic and the gift and the, the really, the, the love and the spirit of Notre Dame. Yeah. And I, I wanna find a way to just put those pictures into words or, or those words into pictures um, in ways that we really speak about this mission of the missionaries that came here on a river, um, but also um, an epic journey that we're still a part of ourselves. I think you might have another book in there at some point, uh, just uh, uh, further elucidating uh, those uh, those analogies about the campus architecture and the and the journey to the soul and to a deeper spirituality. I've learned so much in our discussion, as I always do. Um, I'm going to pick up Pope Francis's "Why Are You Afraid" uh, little booklet as well, and uh, and try to take a closer you know look at that. So I can't thank you enough. Uh, I think uh, Father Dan. Is uh, as a Notre Dame parent, uh, a current parent right now, I feel um, privileged, blessed um, that you're overwatching the soul, uh, overlooking the soul of uh, of my daughter and and the other 8,500 students here, and and their intellectual as well as the development of their hearts and their hearts desires. So thank you uh, for your leadership and and uh, your far ranging curiosity. Let me ask you as we close: it, Would you um, be willing to offer um, everybody who's watching um, a blessing uh, for the new year, uh, for 2022, uh, for they and their families, and then maybe close with uh, a prayer to our patroness. Sure. Be happy to, Lou. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the gifts of each and every one of us in the many ways you've blessed us. Help us each and every day to know that the love that you have for us and may that empower and strengthen us in every way to do the work you've entrusted uniquely to each person. We pray collectively as well, Lord, that you may make Notre Dame a greater source of fruitfulness and that you may help our graduates become not only smarter people, but better people. Give us wisdom and vision, give us courage and strength to do what only you can do. And above all, may we grow in gratitude for your migration to us as we find our migration back home to you. We ask your blessing upon us 
as we pray with your mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. May God bless you, Lou, and everybody on our call. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thanks Privilege so much. Man. Thanks so much. God yeah, bless no, you. A good, great joy and a great privilege to be with you. Um, to everybody out there, best wishes on 2022. We look forward to seeing you um, often in the coming year. Know that our love and prayers are with each and every one of you and your families. Take care. God bless and go Irish. <laughs>